I'm glad to be in the house of God. How about you? Yeah. Amen. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Ephesians chapter 6 as we continue our study through Ephesians and a sub-series right now speaking about the context of what is happening out of Ephesians 6. While you're doing that, happy Labor Day weekend. Hope you're going to enjoy your break tomorrow. Uh, big shout out, some, some things that have been, uh, you know, outreaches and ministries and missions and there's so many things that are happening at Hope Church. We can never mention them all without spending too much time. So we always throw little bits at you here and there. Encourage you to check out the website or app or information center for what's going on. And so one of the things that's relatively new is uh, the amount of food we're able to get keeps increasing. And so we just started, and I won't be tomorrow, but just a couple of weeks ago, we just started a new outreach that we're calling, it's on Mondays, and they call it Senior Shopping. So if you're 60 and over, you're welcome to come on, uh, on Mondays. It's a, like a... a Grocery store shopping experience, you get a cart, you go through it, pick out the food you want, and another outreach, and we just picked up another uh, retirement home where we're taking food to, amen, ministering to people that can't get to us, and so I just love Hope Church, what God's doing, his hand is upon our ministry, that means you, and uh, corporately, and so we're just seeing God do amazing things spiritually, but also practically, uh, in this ministry, in our community. And everybody said, amen. amen. Ephesians chapter 6, and like we have been doing, let's go ahead and read this together. I'm going to put the emphasis on you. Verse 10, we're going to read verse 10 through 18. It's the NIV translation. But are you ready? Can you do this? All right, ready? One, two, three. Begin. Finally, be strong in the Lord. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, we put on the full armor All this, take up the shield of faith, which you can use all. You take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. And in praying the Spirit on all occasions. Come on, give yourself a hand clap for doing an amazing job. It's good to read the Bible. Look to your neighbor and say, it's good to read the Bible. Now let's begin with prayer. Father, we thank you. We stand together in unity and focus and, Lord, in agreement. And we thank you for the power and the truth of your word. Jesus said that we shall know the truth and the truth shall make us free. And so, Father God, we ask right now that you would bring truth and revelation and understanding, spiritual empowerment, that our eyes would be able to see, our ears would be able to hear, and our hearts would be able to receive. I thank you, Father God, regardless of the darkness of the world, that the brightness of your truth and your word will overpower. You have called us to be victorious. You've called us to win. I thank you for victory in every one of our lives, and we give you praise, and everybody shouted. Amen. Last week we started with a different context of this verse. And many people, if you've been in the church world, we, you've probably read it one time or another or heard a message one time or another about the armor of God. But we're taking it from a different perspective. I love the depth of the word of God because there's so many layers in receiving and reading and studying. That's why you can stay in a few verses and read them over and over again and keep meditating on it and just keep digesting it and let the Holy Spirit keep bringing different perspectives. And as I was in, in my own time studying and reading this, this perspective came to my heart. I've never preached it from this angle or this direction. But the power of prayer, you know, in all the context, you can look at big blocks of what's being said. And he's saying, listen, you're going to deal with battles in life. Jesus said that. 
Nowhere in the scriptures does it say that when you start serving the Lord and you love Jesus, everybody's going to love you and everything's going to go your way. Completely the opposite. Christianity is not a crutch. Christianity sometimes can be a target on your back, and the enemy's trying to steal, kill, and destroy. But it also, we have to realize that in the battle, God has given us victory. Say, God has called me to win. Come on, say, God has called me to win. I'm going to work you a little bit this morning, because the reality is we study the New Testament. Don't go back into some Old Testament. In the New Testament, as we study, we find out that God wants you to win. 1 John 4, 4. And 1 John 5, 4, talk about victory. You have overcome the world because you're, you're a child of God. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, your faith. God wants you to win. But God doesn't give you this unusual expectation of there, you'll never have a battle or everything's going to go your way. No, challenges come. Challenges are normal. Defeat is not normal for a child of God or a Christian. Can I get an Amen. And I love it how even 1 John 4 says, you are of God, little children, and have overcome them. See, he didn't say you are of God. You spiritually mature, been serving the Lord and leading a ministry for 30 years. You got your stuff down, and you overcome. No, he says little children, you have overcome them, for greater is he. Say greater. greater. Say greater. So greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Why? Because you are a Christian. You are a child of God. And so as we look at this context, he he begins to say, listen, you're going to deal with battles. And it's not the battles with people. There's a spiritual side to battles. The the enemy will stir up people. The enemy will cause people to be angry. The, The enemy will cause situations to happen. But you don't have to be intimidated because you're called to win. Have you ever been around somebody that just started acting almost crazy around you, uh, against you, and you're like, what is their problem? I didn't do anything against them. I haven't said anything against them. I remember one time I pulled up to a stoplight. I'm minding my own business. And I look over, and this person next to me is screaming. His, I mean, out of control, about to pop a vein. I mean, they were, in, I'm like, what is the wor- going on here? Because I like people. And like you, we like people that like us. And I'm thinking, and the Lord just showed me in, uh, through Revelation that there was, that person was demon-possessed. You know, demon-possessed people will freak out when the presence of God shows up. Did you hear me? Don't worry about every person. If anybody at work or in your life starts acting crazy, don't worry about them. They're demon-possessed, but that doesn't mean they have power over you. You have power over them, and that's what's tormenting the devil. Amen. See, I have power. See, i got to get this in your spirit because when you walk out of here, the battles you fight today, tomorrow, next week, next month, whenever it might be, you can't go in thinking you're weak. You have the, you have the advantage. You are not at a disadvantage. Are you listening to me? The, I know some churches, they have taught us that we are the weak and we are the frail and we are disadvantaged and we have to take the cards that are dealt with you. But I'm telling you from the word of God and the spirit of God, you are not at a disadvantage. You don't have to settle for less. You don't have to take what the devil throws at you and make it years. No, you can stand up, lock the door, close it, kick them out, and let them know as far as you and your house, you will serve the Lord. You will have what God says. You will have, you will be what God says. You can be, you will do what God says. You can do, are you listening to me? You got to let the anointing of God, the word of God on the inside of you, stir up within the battles of life. You don't have to walk around with the Holy Ghost goosebump every minute of the day, but when the enemy shows up, the greater one will rise up. Are you listening to me? When the student shows up, the teacher will show up. And when the... We can't control the world that we can't always control. Oh, I just got to feel this all the time. But I'm telling you, when you have God on the inside of you, little children, that's not an insult. That tells you that the least is still the greatest. I'll show you how much power you have. Just You might have just got saved yesterday. Say, Pastor, I don't know anything. I'm still trying to get a Bible. I'm trying to tell you that even in the kingdom, the least is the greatest against the enemy. Jesus said when he talked about John the Baptist, and he said, of all the prophets born of women, John the Baptist is the greatest. It's a pretty good position. Can you imagine of all the prophets in the Old Testament that you are ranked the the greatest? But then Jesus went on to say, check it out, challenge every idea I throw at you. Jesus went on to say, but the least in the kingdom of God is greater than him. 
I'm telling you, if you just got saved five minutes ago, you just outranked John the Baptist, and he outranks all the other prophets. I'm telling you, because you are a child of God, part of the body of Christ, and Jesus is on the inside of you. The greatness of God is on the inside of you. You have just outranked anything in the Old Testament. You have just outranked anything the enemy would throw at you. Are you listening to me? You are powerful. You are a child of God. You are the son and daughter of the Most High God, and when he walks in, demons tremble. We've noticed that in the battles of life, God wants us to win. Last week we talked about the context, and we're starting from the end of the verses and working our way back to the top. And it said in verse 17, excuse me, it said earlier that to pray for other people. But it's interesting to empower your prayer. All your prayers shouldn't be about you. Paul saying, listen, I'm going to give you a secret. I'm going to give you ingredients to having a powerful prayer. I don't know about you, but I want... My prayer is powerful. I want when I pray, heaven moves, demons tremble, and things change. I, I, I don't like living a life, a Christian walk where I pray and it doesn't go any farther than the ceiling and never see anything change. I don't want when I pray, demons laugh and say, let's watch this fail. No, I want to know that when, I, when you open your mouth, the demons are saying, OMG, they're just saying something. OMG, we have to do something. OMG, he's, uh, he or she is getting ready to pray. When they pray, they get answers. Are you with me? And Paul's saying, listen, let me give you an ingredient to a powerful prayer. Don't let it all be about you. But I'm going, I know. But they said about me, I know. But I need, I know. God knows. But he turned the situation of Job. When Job began to pray for his friends, God turned. When Job began to pray for God's friends, God returned. When Job began to get his eyes just off the him, see the problem is if we in our situation become the number central focused situation in our prayer, in our thoughts, in our conversation, we are becoming self-centered and God, it limits God from doing what God wants to do. Second ingredient. You can get that message last week if you want online. Second ingredient out of Ephesians chapter 6. Are you with me today? I said, are you with me today? Verse 17, the latter part. And take the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Take the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. I can't tell you how many times I've prayed with people or people are saying, will you agree with me in prayer? And I'm like, sure, what's this, what do you want to agree with? Because I know I need to be specific because I believe if we don't know in detail, how can we agree? Pastor, I'm getting ready to have surgery scheduled in two weeks. I need you to agree with me. What are we agreeing for? Are we agreeing for a quick recovery? We're agreeing for a a smooth procedure? We we agreeing that they'll get in there and find out that the, the heart has already been healed and the valves are open and no need for procedure? What are we agreeing for? What are we agreeing? I looked down to see Vinny, and I just watched your video again. About years ago, he had some complication. Wave your hand so people know I'm not making this up, all right? Uh, he, somebody else waved their hand. Quit doing that. you got to pay attention here. And the doctor said he had a heart attack and had some valves that were blocked, and he had set up for a procedure. He showed him the, on the screen the X-ray of here's the, here's the block and had them pick out which, which part that they want to use in, in that particular valve and vein to open it up. He began to seek God and pray. And when he got into the procedure, he came out sooner and his wife says, how to go? And he said, they didn't even do it. So they got in there and nothing was blocked. The doctor said, this is impossible. Isn't that right? See, all things are possible to those who believe. And so it's important to know where to pray, where your agreement. But one of the things that I've noticed a lot of times, and I don't think uh, it, it, that it has been preached enough, is the power and the importance of having prayer tied to you, I mean having the word tied to your prayer. Because I'll ask people, what are, you pray, what are you praying for? I'm praying that God will do this. What's your verse? Well, I don't have a verse, but I know it's in there somewhere. And the the Bible tells us that when the word goes forth, it produces nothing if not mixed with faith. Romans 10, 17, faith comes from hearing the word. If you don't have a scripture, not a general scripture, 
not a I know God can do anything idea. But when you begin to get into the promises of his word. When you get into the promises and begin to have something revealed to your heart, when you have the power of the word and you can mix it with your prayer, it empowers, it increases the power of your prayer exponentially. Are you listening to me? Let me give you three things to help tie this together. Number one, when you pray, when you pray, remember, remember the promise of the word. Any prayer, say with me, any prayer below the promise is powerless. Say that again. Say any prayer below the promise is powerless. Jeremiah one twelve says it this way. Then the Lord said to me, you have seen well for I am actively watching over my word to fulfill it. One translation says I am watching over my word to perform it. What does God do? He's not watching over your words. He's watching over his word. See, when you were saying your words, your words might not hit the top of the throne room of heaven. Why? Because you were saying what you were thinking. But when you begin to include God's word, he watches over his word to perform it. When you begin to say what God is saying and pray what God has already promised you, it gets the attention of God. It causes angels to stand at attention. Why? Because God watches over his word to perform it. Are you listening to me? If you're praying, God, help me survive this day, you have no power because there's not a promise in the word of God that God says, I'll give you enough to survive today. I'm, I'll give you enough money just to barely pay rent. I'm going to allow you to live in poverty and live like a pauper but because you're a child of God, and I'm just going to allow you to have the crumbs. That's not what God's word says. God doesn't give his children crumbs. He prepares a table for you, even in the midst of the enemy, the Bible says. What am I telling you? Get the promise from the word and let it set the standard of your faith. You say, but that's a pretty big deal. That's why you need faith. If it was easy, anybody would do it. If you, if it, too many people are praying what situations can happen automatically. Oh, I just pray, I just pray that I can, can make it through the end of the year, you know, and, or I'll just pray that I can be nice to my family when I get together in the holidays with them. You know, that's something you can control yourself. Why do you need prayer when you can do it on your own? Prayer is to begin to access heaven that's beyond your earthly ability. We, we pray little prayers and we wonder why God doesn't move. God's not interested in moving on stuff that you're really doing on your own. And you say, God, I'll thank you for that. But in the back of your mind, you're saying, boy, I'm glad I was able to do that. Why aren't we praying? If we really believe that God hears and answers prayer, and like Jesus said, all things are possible to those who believe. Do you believe this, Mary and Martha? And that was the context there. Oh, I believe. If we truly believe, then why do we pray prayers that are so small that they really don't need God? Why aren't we praying? Oh, I'm praying my, my son stays out of jail. Why are you praying your son stays out of jail? Why don't you pray that he gets so saved, filled with the Holy Ghost and anointed, that he'll start going to full? Why don't you just raise that bar just a little bit higher? Raise the bar a little bit higher. Are you listening to me? Why are you praying that you get a 3% cola increase this year? Why don't you, in, a, in an economy where they're struggling, why don't you start praying for a 15% increase? Raise the bar a little higher. Do something that they don't do. We got testimonies of employers pulling employees away and saying, now listen, I got to tell you, we've given you a big raise, but don't say anything because we've actually had to cut other people and we've had to let people go. But for you, we gave a raise that we've never, never given before. God, don't you think God can do that? Don't you think? I'm telling you, he's done it before. Well, I got about half of the people interested. The other half are not too sure. Say, so raise the bar a little higher. I mean, I, I, we had a member a few years ago who came to me and said, Pastor, I want you to agree with me in prayer. They just told us Friday they're going to have to let people go Monday, and the ones that are staying, they're probably going to get a cutback. Can you pray that I keep my job? And out of my spirit, it wasn't in my head. It was out of my spirit. Something stirred. That's the Holy Spirit. And I said, no, I'm not going to pray that. Why should we pray that you survive? I can't find that in the Scripture. Lord, pray that I keep what you've already given me. No, God is a God of conquest. Are you listening to me? You get this in your spirit, you're going to be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Not because you feel it, because you know it. When the, you'll, you'll have the attitude when the devil messes with you that by the time you get done, he's going to wish he didn't mess with you because you're not going to settle for what you have. Why are you trying to keep what you got? 
If you're going to go to war, there's, Jesus said there is a plunder to the one who binds a strong man. You don't go to war to keep something. You go to war to come out victorious, and you come out ahead. Can I get an amen? Come on, can I get a better amen? I'm not saying you're not going to get, deal with challenges in life, but your mindset should be, wait a minute, I'm going to raise the bar to the promise, and if the devil's going to mess with me, I want more than I had before. And I took, it came out of a spirit. I said to her, no, I'm not going to agree with you that you keep your job. That's too small of a prayer. Let's pray that you get a raise and promotion. She thought for a second, and she said, okay, I'll agree to that. She called me a few days later, and she said, Pastor, I went back to work, and it was on Tuesday. Pastor, I went back to work, and on Tuesday, they let us know, and she said, there is a group that were fired and people that had cutbacks, but they gave me my boss's job, and I just got a raise and a promotion. He can do it for you. If he does it for one, he is not a respecter of persons. He can do it for you. Say, he can do it for me. I'm telling you, he can restore your marriage. He can heal your body. He can increase your finances. He can bring peace where there was no peace. He can bring wholeness when there was nothing. You maybe have never experienced wholeness in your life. You may have had a journey of brokenness your whole life, and it makes no sense. But let me remind you of Abraham and Sarah. Let me tell you, because she had never had a womb that worked. He, she had never conceived in her life. It wasn't she had miscarriages. She had never been pregnant. Her own past experience was always, I cannot get pregnant. But the God of more than enough showed up and said, it's through not only you, Abram, but it's also through Sarah that this covenant of blessing will happen. And something will happen in her that had never happened. I'm ready to hear stories. I'm looking for testimonies of people to experience God at a level that they didn't know was possible and to have a story that they didn't know they could tell and be around. They've been around people that, you know, water fire finds its own level, and all of a sudden you've lived with people that are just like you, that have been living broken, have been living without, have been living limited, but all of a sudden you begin to experience God and the truth of his word, and you begin to believe, God, I'm not going to pray down here anymore. I'm going to raise the level a little bit, bit higher because I need you. I need to pray a prayer that without God it will not happen. I need to pray a prayer that, God, if it's not you, it won't work. I need to pray a prayer that if you don't do it, I won't make it. I need a prayer prayer. What am I saying? Raise the bar to the promise of his word. Come on, if you agree with that, give him a 10 second shot and praise. This will not be a church of people who are t intimidated by the situation and intimidated by big prayers. When the enemy rises up, someone greater is on the inside of you. And you can say, I've never seen it done this way. Jesus, listen, study the ministry of Jesus. He was constantly doing something they had no point of reference. He was multiplying a, a little boy's lunch to feed a multitude. He was stopping the storm. He was touching a casket and the child would be raised from the dead. He was doing stuff they had no idea. There's no, you can't find scripture saying, spit in the ground, make mud, and put it on the blind and they will see. It wasn't, they had no point of reference. He was not limited to the history of man. He was not limited to the past of man. He was not limited to how people saw it. And in the name of Jesus, by the authority in that name. I set you free from the past perspective that would try to hinder you from your future potential. Someone shout a praise. I hear in my sphere, some of you are going to have the phrase said to you, I've never seen it done that way before. I've never heard of a story like that before. You're going to have a story that will shock the minds of the unbelievers and the people that don't have faith. Why? Because you're going to begin to demonstrate with the brightness and clarity of the light of the word that the God you serve, that the God you pray to, that the God you sing to, that his name is Jesus and he is still alive and he's still saving, healing, delivering, blessing. He's still active in the lives of his people. If you believe that, give him a shout. Remember the, remember the promise of the word. And when you get a hold of a promise, I'm telling you, it will be higher than what you thought. Number two, when you pray. 
when you pray, remember the promise of the word. Number two, re- realize the power of the word. This precious book that we have in paper, there's more to that than just this book. Words on paper. It is a living, living truth. It carries power. See, it carries power. Say the word works. Oh, you listen to me. The word works. Even if you don't understand how it works, it still works. People get all, I don't, it doesn't make sense to me. Your car doesn't make sense to you. Your TV doesn't make sense to you. You don't even know what HK, uh, UHD 8K is, but you turn on that TV to watch that movie. I'm telling you, you don't have to fully understand everything to get it to work for you. The word works. The power of the seed, the Bible says, is within itself. You don't have to figure it all out. You just have to be able to release it and let it do its thing. Can I get an Amen. John's John's Gospel, chapter 6, verse 63, the latter part, King James says, the words that I speak to you, this is Jesus talking, the words that I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. They are spirit and they are life. Jesus said, the words that I speak to you, they are spirit and they are what? Life. They are spirit and they are what? Life. John chapter 1 says, in him was life. Stay with me. In Jesus was what? Life. And the life was the light. And the life was the light of men. And the light shines in darkness, and the darkness comprehends it not. Which means the darkness cannot hold it back. You never walk into a room in a dark room and flip on a switch, and the, if the electricity and light bulb are working and turn on, you never see a battle between light and dark, do you? Can you imagine if all of a sudden half the room was dark and half the room was light, and the struggle was going back? It doesn't work that way. Look to your neighbor and say, it doesn't work that way. Why? Because when the entrance of the word, show, excuse me, when the entrance of light comes, darkness has to flee. No choice, no argument, no debate, lightness moves darkness out. But Psalms 119 says that the entrance of his word gives light. The entrance of his word, stay with me, stay with me, and I want you to understand this. The entrance of his word gives light. It gives understanding. Now I know what light is. Light is the understanding of God's word. See, you can have a mental understanding to be able to explain it, but no heart revelation to accept it. Matthew 13 tells us that when they hear the word and get understanding, then the seed of the word goes into their heart. We need to have understanding of the word for it to get to our heart. Because with a heart, Romans says, with a heart man believes unto righteousness, with a mouth confession is made unto salvation. It's in the heart we believe, not in the mind. People know in the mind and they think they got it. No, it's you can know it in your mind and be able to explain it, but you can't obtain it until it gets into your heart. Do you see the difference? Well, I thought if I just knew it and could quote it and believed it, it should be good enough. No, you need revelation that comes from the Spirit of God. You need understanding. And when the understanding of that word comes into your heart, it gives you light. It gives you life. There's life. There's light. And darkness can't hold it back. Well, Pastor, I don't know. I just think if I know it, it should be, if I believe it should be good enough. James chapter 2 says, you believe that there is one God. Look at that on the screen. You believe that there is one God. They'll throw it up. James 2 verse 19. You believe that there is one God. You do well. Devils also believe. Notice, devils also believe that there is a God. And do what? They tremble. There is power in the word of God. Most people, we've watched too many uh, demon-possessed movies, and we started believing the, the culture and the lies that the devil's more powerful than God. I'm telling you, devils tremble at the light of God's word. Devils tremble at the presence of God. Devils believe that he is real. Devils know that he is real, and they tremble. Didn't that happen when Jesus walked? I mean, demon-possessed people would show up and say, we know who you are. You're, you're the son of God. Have you come to torment us before the time? Emphasis added. Have you come? What are they saying? We know who you are. We recognize who you are. We see that you're the light. We know you are the word. We know you are the son of God. We know you've come from heaven. And they were saying, we don't think you have a right. You don't have a right. Have you come before the time to torment us? Because they know when the light shows, they have to flee. 
But they didn't realize that Jesus not only came as a son of God, he came as a son of man through a virgin birth, which means he had a, a human suit on, which gave, him, which, which gave him natural authority in this three-dimensional world. And so he could look at him and say, now you got to go. And they had to go. The man with the, a legion of demons didn't come run and said, I'm going to take you. You can't stop me. He came and fell down at the feet of Jesus and said, I surrender. Just let me go into these pigs. There's power in the word. There's power in the word. John 1, 1, in the beginning was the word. The word was with God. And the word was God. Verse 14, and the word became flesh. There is power in the revelation, the reign of the word. When you pray, you don't pray sissy prayers. When you pray, you don't pray powerless prayers. When you have the word tied to your prayer, know that your prayer gets the attention of heaven. It rocks and makes demons tremble. Why? Because the word has power. A little late, but glad to have you. The, say the word has power. Man, never go to prayer with a passive attitude. You don't have to scream. You don't have to be something you're not. But you need to know that you are strong in the Lord and the power of his might. When you pray, it carries power. When you pray, when you got the word, you're not standing on something. Well, Lord, I really need. Lord, I'm really hurting. Lord, this is, this is not fair. Now, all that stuff is garbage. Throw it out. Throw it out, get rid of it, and begin to approach heaven with the, with the truth of his promise and say, Father, I thank you. Your word says that 1 Peter 2.24, by his stripes, you, that we were made healed. And I thank you, Father God, that you watch over your word to perform it. I thank you that Exodus 50, 20, verse 26 tells me that it, you are the God that heals me. I thank you, Matthew 15, 26 tells me that healing is bread for you, the children. I thank you, Father God, that I am the healed of the Lord. The sickness and disease cannot stand nor stay in my body. Why? Because your word says so. You are the God that heals me. You have sent your word. And the Bible says that he sent his word and healed them and delivered them from all destruction. He is the God that heals you. Psalms 103 verse 3. Are you listening? You get a hold of the word and you begin to pray that way. You're not going to walk out and say, I wonder if he's going to do it. You're going to walk into a place of I know it's done. Say the word works. It carries power. So when you pray, remember the promise of the word. Set that bar a little higher. Because any prayer below the promise of the word of God has no power. When you pray, realize that there's power in that word that you're praying. It's not just an idea. It's power. It carries power. It carries power. Last but not least, when you pray, release the path of the word of God. Release the path. What do you see? What are you talking about? Isaiah 55, 11 says, So shall my word be that goes forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but accomplish that to which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing I sent it. When you are sending something, it has a path. When it's moving forward, it has a path. What a lot of Christians don't realize is the power of the words that they are saying. Proverbs says, death and life are in the power of the tongue. James says that your life is directed like a bit in a horse's mouth or a rudder to a ship. Your, your life is directed by the words that are coming out of your mouth. When you begin to line up with God's word, see confession, there's confession of sin, but there's also this thing called faith confession, which literally means I'm not saying what I feel, hear, or see. I am saying what God is saying about the situation. I'm not denying what I see. I'm just saying that there's something more eternal I need to set my focus on. Are you listening to me? And not to get ahead of myself. But the power of God, when we release it, what we are saying, and the word in confession is actually in the New Testament, is homologio, which means to say the same thing. So I begin to release the word of God. God has sent his word, the Bible says. He has sent his word and healed them and delivered them from all their destruction. But when God sends his word, it will not return void unless I don't receive it. Because we know people who we thought should have, would have, and could have, but they didn't. Why didn't they get healed? Why didn't, they, why didn't that prayer get answered? And many times as we go to pray one thing and then we begin to speak something else. 
We say we magnify God, but all we do is spend all our time complaining and magnifying the problem. Don't shout me down. We say God's healed me, and two days later we're saying I'm dying and I can't make it. We have stopped the word. See, one of the things you've got to understand is the word is all powerful, but God will never override your will. If God would override your will, he'd make everybody get saved. Some of us say that would be nice. But he has given you the ability to choose. You have to choose. He told Mary and Martha, something amazing is going to happen. Your, your brother is going to rise again. Remember that story. I love that story. I like saying it because like, it's important for us to hear it. And Martha spoke up and said, yes, Lord, I know he's going to rise again at the last day. And Jesus said, Martha, don't you realize I am the resurrection and I am life. Do you believe in this? Yes, Lord, I believe. Okay, let's go to, your, let's go to where the problem's at. Let's go to the place where your brother's at. Let's go. And when he got there, he said, okay, remove the stone. And Martha said, Lord, by now he's been smelling. All of a sudden he said, Jesus said, wait a minute. I thought you said you believed. If you believe, all things are possible to those who believe. Why? Because when she said she believed, but her heart didn't really believe. Because her heart didn't believe because she didn't line up with the instruction. Because Jesus said, I need you to remove the obstacle of the word. I'm getting ready to say something, and I want to make sure the obstacle's removed. You're looking at the problem. I'm looking at the obstacle. You're looking at the impossible. I'm looking at the humanity side. I need you to trust me enough to remove the obstacle so that the word goes forth will accomplish that to which it's sent. We're saying, oh, with all things, you know, pastor, with God, all things are possible. Okay, I'll agree with that. If you believe, the Bible says, but anyway. Well, why didn't, if that's true, why didn't Jesus say, everybody step back? I'm going to come through here, and I'm going to speak and watch that stone move and watch the dead come out. God, all things are possible. Why couldn't he speak and make that stone crumble into dust? It's getting quiet. Because the Bible tells me he created all things. All things were created by him and for him, and nothing was made that was made. Without him, there's, every, there's no existence of anything. He created it. So why couldn't the creator of heaven and earth, why couldn't he look at that rock and say, dust. He could have. But if he did, he would not have access to Mary's authority in the situation. He said, I need you to remove the obstacle so you were giving me permission. That's what it's all about, giving God's authority. His word is ranked the highest. Psalms 119, he has elevated his word above his name. Are you listening to me? And what happens when we obey doesn't fix the problem, doesn't create the miracle. Our obedience removes the obstacle from uh, hindering what God, and it's basically saying, Lord, have your way. Lord, do you think? I want you to do this. Okay, I don't understand it, but I'll bake the pie and take it to my neighbor. Uh, I want you to invite them to church. It don't make sense, but I'll invite them to church. Well, all you're doing is obeying. You don't understand it all. You don't have to. It's allowing the word to have path. When we begin to speak and obey the word, Isaiah 55, it goes forth. Ezekiel said it this way. I love this. Ezekiel 37. You remember about the valley of dry bones? And God said, see these bones, they're going to be a great army. God said, I'll do something with nothing that nobody can see potential in it, and I'll make something great. And we know the story of it becoming an army. But he said in verse 7, I spoke this message just as he told me. I spoke, one translation says, I spoke as I received the command. As I heard the command, I spoke it. The prophet didn't create the power. The prophet didn't create the miracle. All the prophet did is speak the command that he heard. Are you listening to me? It wasn't, the, it wasn't the prophet's words that did it. It was the command of God, the heaven's command through the mouth of the prophet that made the miracle happen. Do you see what I'm saying? To remember the centurion soldier, uh, which is a story about coming, and he's, Jesus said, I'll come to your house and heal your servant. And he said, listen, you don't need to come to my house. Do you remember this? And he said, all you need to do is speak the word only because I'm a man under authority and I'm a, and a man under authority. And I say to one, go, and he goes, and another, come, and he comes. And he 
he said, all you need to do is speak the word only and my servant shall be healed. And Jesus said, I have not seen such great faith. No, not even in Israel. Are you listening to me? And I want you to know that anybody who's ever been in the military knows something. That when someone in the higher rank says something, it's not a suggestion. Darling, I want you to stay with me. Let's break it down a little more. How many people have ever been in the military? Come on, lift your hands. So you agree with me or disagree with me. When, when the general talks to the sergeant, is it a, is it a suggestion? No. Is it something they're saying? No. What do they call it? They call it an order or a command. What are they saying? Something of higher authority has released a command, and I expect you to obey it. And he said, I am under authority and over authority, which means when he begins to speak a command, it happens. But where does he get the command? By the higher authority. See, what are we doing in the church world sometimes when we don't have a revelation and understanding is we begin to say a bunch of stuff, but it's never a command from heaven. It sounds good. We parrot other people's ideas. We are speaking, but we have nothing happening because everything we are saying came from us and not from heaven. But when you get a command from heaven... When all of a sudden, it goes from an idea on this book to an understanding in your heart. That's a command from heaven. When all of a sudden, you begin to say, I will not die but live and declare the works of the Lord because it became alive to you. you got a command in heaven. When all of a sudden, uh, Ezekiel 37 verse 5 says, I will put breath in your lungs and you shall live. you got a command from heaven. And when you get a command from heaven, you don't have to make the miracle happen. You begin to speak the command because the heaven's command is the highest authority. Because if a private disobeys an order from a colonel who got it from the general, he's in trouble from everybody on the way up. What do you mean you didn't obey the command? He said, listen, I'm under authority and over authority. And I say to one, go, and guess what? I don't have to think about it. It's done because I understand authority. And everybody that's under me understands authority. And when I get a command, I release it. When I release it, it's done. Yeah. Well, I'm just not going to listen to anybody. I'm not saying be under abuse from people. But I'm talking about under heaven. When heaven speaks, you begin to release it. You don't say it because you feel it. You don't say it because it looks probable. You don't say it because you think, you, you understand. You say it because heaven's given you a rhema. And when you get the command, don't be just parroting stuff. The reason, the reason Romans 10, 17 says faith comes by hearing is because as you're speaking the word, you're feeding your spirit. And in that process, you can get a rhema. You can get a revelation by the spirit of God. But once you get that understanding, now you're in a position of authority. Because the word works. The word is the ultimate authority. The word has power. Demons tremble. And what are you doing? You are basically saying, I'm giving you access into this area of my life. And you begin to say what God is saying in this situation. It's not mind over matter. It's not parroting garbage. It's a matter of saying, I have received a command from heaven. Oh, God, give us a command. You know, Lord, give, speak a command from heaven for me today. Speak a command from heaven. I need a command for my family. For my finances, I need a command from heaven. For my health, I need a command from heaven. Oh, God, I just don't want to try things like I'm throwing darts. We need a command from heaven into our understanding of our spirit so that we can release it and allow you to be who you've called to be in our life. A command from heaven. Last but not least, and I appreciate your time today. You doing okay? How do I get a command? John 15, verse 7 and 8. If you abide in me and my words abide in you. Notice that. If you abide in me, and my words abide. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you shall then ask. See, we ask when we're afraid. We, are, we ask when we get attacked. We ask when we are hurting. We ask, and we can't figure out why our ask is not producing results. Because we haven't had anything stored up of understanding in our heart. But when, it, it's like a shotgun, when that, when that thing is locked and loaded, come on somebody. When it's locked and loaded with the truth of the word of God, the enemy shows up, what do you do? You're just releasing the truth of the word into the situation. You're, call, you're calling for heaven's will to be done. Thy will be done on earth 
as it is in heaven. Do you see that? When you pray, remember the promise of the word. Realize the power of the word. And release the path of the word. Because the word empowers your prayer. Amen. If you received anything from that, give the Lord a hand clap of praise. If you'd be so gracious to bow your head and close your eyes, if you're here today and do not have a real relationship with Jesus Christ, I'm not asking you to join a church, denomination, or religion. I'm asking you a question that only you can answer. Is Jesus Christ real to you today? In a way that you know for yourself, he's real and your Lord and Savior. Only you can answer that. It's not about a bunch of rules of do's and don'ts. Although I'm not saying that you can live any way you want. Romans 6 says absolutely not. But some people are doing all the rules and they have no relationship. Some people are doing all the routine and they have no relationship. Some people are doing the right thing but no relationship. And they become an empty shell and they're miserable because there's no relationship. It's out of that real relationship with Jesus Christ. When you know for yourself and the way you process and experience that, number one, he's real, and two, that he's your Lord and Savior, that's where life comes. That's where life comes. That's where life, it's not about being more disciplined. It's about having a real relationship that affects your, the routines of your life. With every head bowed and every eye closed, if you're here and say, Pastor, I don't have a real relationship with Jesus, but I want one. Include me in that prayer. If that's you, I want you to say this prayer with me. Romans 10 says, those who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Say this prayer with me. Say, Heavenly Father, I repent of all my sins. I turn to you today. I believe in my heart, and I confess with my mouth that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that he came to this earth in the flesh, died on the cross for my sins, was buried for me, and on the third day rose again for me. Because I believe that, I ask you, Jesus, to come into my heart, wash me in your blood, forgive me, cleanse me, be my Lord and Savior. Thank you for saving me. Amen. Amen. Now, if you prayed that prayer, just so I know who I was praying with, I want you to wave your hand right now. Just wave your hand. Pastor, I prayed that prayer. I see the hand in the back. God bless you. Anybody else? I see the second hand. God bless you. I look over the center section, over to the, my right. I see the hand. Thank you, sir. God bless you. Anybody else? Pastor, I was in that prayer. I see the other hand. God bless you. I see the hand. God bless you. I see the hand. God bless you. Amen. Amen. I see the hand over there. God bless you. Anybody else? Amen. Come on, give him a hand clap of praise.